mustache tails. Yeah! Hello, it's Jay Chater Sakar and Ace MacArthur, and we are here for a new episode of Mustache Tales. Today's guest is the incredible writer, producer, Kristen Hahn. And really, thank Kristen, I gotta thank say, you. I love the mustache. I really thank do. Thank you. I, I, I thought I was showing up for the mustache. It's tale. amazing, Jay. We work, this is like what, an audio medium? Uh, uh, recording a conversation with one of your best buddies and talking to their best buddy is what we're doing right now. But Kristen has a mustache on, and we never have mustaches, and we named our show Mustache Tales. That's commitment. I I feel misled. I do. And I actually, I'm sad you guys aren't with me in person because I did bring a mustache party with me, which is a whole selection of mustaches I could have adorned you with, and you could have chosen from Smarty, Rogue, Scoundrel, Casanova, Party Boy, or Bandito. Party boy. I know Hayes and I both want party boy. You guys are party boys. You don't need it. <laughs> is, it really, is, it, is it a thin mustache? Right, like, fine. Really I'm, I'm disappointed in you, but I'm taking off my mustache. I will retire. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to just introduce you briefly. So Kristen is uh, a, a producer, uh, which in Hollywood means writer um, on television uh, of, of the morning show. Um, also, uh, behind the films Cake, Tumble Down, Dumplin', and, and many others. Um, and she and I uh, became friends because our daughters became friends at age three um, and are still best friends today in, in high school. And Ace is going to tell a little story, but I'll just tell this real quick one. Every now and then, I mean, I look, I still, um, I still drink occasionally. And uh, I run into <laughs> uh, your daughter and, and my daughter and, and my in my living room and um, you know, maybe I look a little hungover, right? Maybe I do. Right. And your daughter will mock me and she'll say, Oh, did you have too much daddy juice last night? Because <laughs> when I was, when I was little, when they were little, I would be drinking these vodka sodas and they would come over to try to get a sip. I'm like, no, no, this is daddy juice. And your daughter has held on to that little joke and she just hits me and hits me. I love it. I love it. That's why I love your daughters, and I get two of them because you have twins. So that's double, double trouble and double joy. And yeah, one of them was in my kitchen last night. So we take ah. turns. <laughs> so your kids are of the age where they're completely self-aware. Like, so Jay, you just admitted to being an alcoholic, and I'm really proud of you for that. <laughs> that's the first step, Jay. You did it through your daughter's friend, which is admirable. I mean, <laughs> here, but she noticed how hungover you consistently were. <laughs> and like, essentially, it stuck with you for years. Right, right. That's right, right. Yeah, good story. Good tale. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I woke up uh, this morning at, uh, I played golf yesterday, and I came home, did my responsibilities as a father, had a new puppy, put the kids to bed, left about four or five Coors Lights on the, you know, mantle next to the yeah. fire. And I woke up this morning and I heard a lot about it from both my, you know, my kids are 12 and eight and they questioned me on these these drinks. And when they're lined up, the empty beer cans, it does look like a lot, but it was over the course of a couple hours. I just didn't throw them away. Solo. <laughs> so You gotta throw them so, away, guys. Clean up your mess. I know, you gotta bury the evidence. I know Kristen from the morning show, from working on uh, the Apple television show, um, the first season, which was a very exciting job for me. And I, we want to talk about that, obviously. But when I was talking to Jay, sometimes we talked a couple minutes before the podcast, and he told me um, some of your, like, I was like, what is she into besides, like, you know, Hollywood stuff? Like, what's right. her angle? And he said, well, you know, she believes in ghosts. <laughs> when I, was, uh, I don't what? believe in them i know them to be real but go ahead you know ghosts to be real yeah that triggered that triggered maybe 90 million stories in my head and the one that i wanted to start with because you know the, the format is you committed to the mustache but we we tell a story to start and so my mustache tale that you brought out for this episode is i was raised in chicago and a, my mother was very Catholic. Like, not Catholic, like, 
on the page Catholic, like uh, Luke, John, Old Testament, New Testament, like she would say, tucking me in at bed, uh, uh, there's angels everywhere. There's oh. spirit. You know, it was, Great, it was scary this, stuff. <laughs> yeah, but the stuff that scares you straight when you're a kid, yeah. you know, like no one's watching. Sure. And so there was an article that came out, you know, before we had phones and before we had computers, it was like in the newspaper that there was a statue outside Chicago. I think it was like Mundelein, Illinois. It was a statue of a Virgin Mary who was known to be crying. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Do you remember that? It was yeah. like a, a very long time ago. But there, wow. And so there was almost this like a pilgrimage to go see this statue. Right. So my, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm young. My, my brother's really young. We're probably like, you know, 10, 12, around the age of my kids now. And we drive out to Mundelein, Illinois to, to see this statue. We don't know where we're going. Like we think we're going to Toys R Us with the big stuff. I think that's how my mom duped us into this. And it's pouring rain. We drive an hour and a half. And as we get close to the crying Virgin Mary statue, we're like driving through a cemetery and my brother and I go, mom, like, where, where are we going? This is so weird. It's what, and she goes, we're going to see the crying Virgin Mary. We have to do this. And as she was driving in the, rain? The, statue, in the <laughs> rain and she had like a, a Oldsmobile three bird, there was a woman with like a cloak over her head, uh, walking through the cemetery on the road, like, with a cane and she was like an old woman with a she she it just she did she had an energy about her yeah. and so my mom stopped the car i was sitting in the front seat it was a two-door car and she said we're gonna give this woman a ride and my brother and i are like no we're not this is scary enough we did. so this woman sat in the front seat of the car and while she was in the front seat of the car, my brother and I were in the back of this, you know, small car. And she was bending over with a rosary in her hand, rocking. Uh, right. So she's and she's speaking like it was like an Eastern European language. I would say Slavic. I don't know. It was like we drove for like three miles with this woman in the car. I'm looking at my brother in the back seat, like, what is going on? And the woman gets out of the car to go see the crying statue in the rain. My mom shuts the door and she goes, boys, that was an angel. And it freaked us out. And then she goes, let's get out of the car and go see this statue. So we go and there's probably, you know, I'm not going to say like hundreds. There's probably like 20 or 30 people standing outside the statue. Uh And my mom goes, do you see the Virgin Mary? The statue is crying. And my brother looks at me and he goes, it's raining. (laughs) (laughs) It's. Really, really crying a lot. <laughs> but I don't know. Something like that stuck with me. You know, like there, it wasn't the Love statue. It. it was the woman in the car that we were actually confronting or going right. to see. Right. Does that make sense? Like it was yes. like we went to go seek out this thing and it wasn't the thing. It was the thing on the way. Isn't that the metaphor for life? And and also your mom's pretty awesome. Come on. Giving the lady a ride and was walking in the rain it would have taken her a day to reach the statue sounds like the at the pace she was going Kristen when I first heard you you um knew ghosts to be real it was a um a little bit of like a uh like a shock to my system because prior to that you and I've had 10 million conversations and they're all super rational, super logical, super. And so it made it rattled me a little bit because I'm like, if this rational person believes in ghosts, knows them to be real, then my whole worldview is, is in question. Uh, because then, up until then, I'm like, I know them not to be real. But the problem is, you know, my, we did a little Ouija board thing and I don't, I don't mean to build to like reduce this to, to the Ouija board, but but when we were doing it, we were like 10 and we were trying to raise my friend's sister who had died. Uh, and, you know, there were like a bunch of nine year olds, 10 year olds around a Ouija board. And my friend whose sister had died, we're like, you know, we're doing all this stuff. And and suddenly he slams his head on the on the table and comes up and goes, Catherine. And we were like, ah, and it was fucking terrifying. And I told my mother. 
And my mother's from India, and she is a radiologist and very fucking rational. Although she's a real believer in God. She doesn't believe in organized religion. She just believes and she meditates and she prays. And she told me, she goes, do not mess with that world. Do not open up that world. And I was like, what? And so I, I stayed there. I closed that thing down. And so I, I closed it down so much I stopped believing in it. And then I ran into you and you're like, and, um, and, and I almost feel like more comfortable. Like I'm almost, I don't want to open it up because. Yeah, like, I hear you. You know, like, isn't it like a channel thing where you can go, I, I'm off, I'm off right here. I don't know. If it, is a little, it is a little bit like a radio in my opinion. Yeah. And you can turn it on or off and you can, you can change it to a channel that, you know, has a heavy metal or really nice country. You know, I mean, ghosts, there are all kinds of ghosts out there from, from, my experience i remember that day because i think we, we were at a soccer game maybe for the yeah. girls i'll do anything to avoid watching children's soccer uh and so <laughs> i'm sure that was i was like please you you please. probably asked me to tell you a story and yes, i was like all right probably. i'll tell you a ghost story yeah well i you know i didn't know i didn't know ghosts to be real until i had one very specific experience and it's not like my life is filled with ghost stories. I don't walk around talking to ghosts, guys. I produce and write and do other things and raise kids. I am very rational. But what I've come to realize for myself is that uh, realizing that there's something beyond us is 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 rational. And, and, you know, it the, the the universe is a very complex, mysterious place. And I just never believed that when we die, we really just disintegrate you know, we're flesh and bone and that's it. And I think part of that came from being present for someone's death and realizing um, that when they left their body, it was like their, their energy, their spirit, I can't, you can't even explain it if, unless you've really experienced it. That who they were, their essence just left the room. It was yeah. just so, there, there's something about that, um, the body and the spirit thing. Yeah. So anyway, when I was in my early 20s, I came home one night. I'll tell you the really quick story because since you love mustache tales, um, I came home one night and I lived alone. I was probably 23 um, and I opened my door and women have a sixth sense for feeling someone's in the house. Uh, we just do. So I opened the door. It's dark in my little apartment and I had a, a shotgun apartment in Laurel Canyon and I had like the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I thought, oh, fuck, I, is someone in my, is someone hiding in my apartment? So I, I grabbed a pan, which happened to be right by the door of my kitchen. It was a tiny apartment. So literally you walk in and you're in the kitchen. I grab a pan, I flip on the light and I, and I go like that. I just look down. I can see my whole apartment with one look and I looked down the hallway and I saw an image of my grandmother in her thirties, not in her present age because she was in her 70s like 60s late 60s 70s at that time she walked from my bathroom through the hallway into what would have been my closet and i i just was like what i'd never seen a ghost before in my life and i could feel i you know it was my grandma by the way she was alive at this moment okay so my grandma right. is alive in albuquerque new mexico as far as i know at this moment. So I am very freaked out that a youthful version of my grandma just walked through my hallway. And the trippy part, and this is not something I've experienced since, the trippy part is I could hear her voice. I could, I could, it was like not audi, it was not audible, but it it like was transmitting. It was very strange, you guys. And basically my grandma was bipolar and a severe alcoholic. And her main message was she was apologizing for all the harm she had caused. And she wanted me to tell my family that she was sorry and that it wasn't really, that's not who she really was, that that was her body, that was her brain. It was not actually who she is. And she basically passed out like a bunch of apologies and some very specific ones to my mom, to my aunt, to my grandpa. 
needless pass to say, them out. And in, in what way did you hear her passing those messages out to those people? Like you just, felt it? It wasn't like verb. Was it verb? It was. They, it was like a typewriter in my head. I can't explain it. It was very right, specific right. messages, including like things to my grandpa, like. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send him somebody else and, you know, tell him anytime he feels he sees a rainstorm coming, it's me. I'm sending my love. Um, like re really specific things. And so I then she's gone, disappeared. Whoa. And I have I have the feeling that I am instead of sad, I am the most elated I've ever been. I cannot explain it. I I now know I'm like oh my God, we really don't die. It, I'm so elated by this experience and this information and that my grandma's okay, that she's not, a, you know, suffering on the other side, that I'm ready to, I, it's like the party. I'm, I'm ready to, I want to go dancing. And my phone rings and it's my mom and she's hysterically crying and she says, grandma died. And, and I had to kind of pretend to be sad in that moment, which was very weird and surreal. And I got on a plane immediately, flew home. And it was too much for my family for me to say, hey, I saw grandma guys right before you called me. It was too too much for them to take in. So I just said, uh, I fell asleep on the plane. I had a dream on the plane. And grandma came to me in the dream. And this is what she said. And I passed out all the messages. And I fell asleep. That uh, afternoon, I took a nap. I was exhausted by this whole thing. Um, and I took a nap and I woke up and it was pouring out. I mean, pouring rain, which was a very odd time for it to be raining in New Mexico. And I came down and my grandpa was like, okay, I hear you, you know. Uh -huh. So anyway, that was that was my one like serious experience. And since then, I have remained open-minded and had, you know, different kinds of smaller experiences. But that was the one for me that was like, I basically said, guys, I'm good. I get it. I, I don't need to have any more ghost experiences. But, because it was so real for you yeah. and you shared it and you were like, I'm good. It doesn't happen to you a lot though, right? Like you no. wouldn't consider yourself someone who has these experiences, like a like a medium or someone who this stuff happens to um, No, but I did realize that it is, like I said, it is like a radio and I, I choose to kind of turn it off. Uh, I, I can I can tap into that stuff, but I choose to turn it off because I want to live in the real world. I, I'm not interested in being a medium, you know? So, I have I have a couple of questions. Well, one, I think it would be so relaxing to me to know that so that I can stop thinking about whether this is it. Well, is there more? Are there yeah. ghosts? You know, like, I, yeah. I don't spend a ton I of time just, on it, but, you know, I, you know, just it would be nice to I know. Mean, just for the listener, we're not high right now. We're having a real <laughs> conversation. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> We're going down this rabbit that, hole like 10 minutes in and I'm here for it. So I'm, thank uh, you. You. I'm so confident in it that I'm not even worried about my reputation. Uh, exactly. By the way, though, I would say I would never touch a Ouija board just so we're clear ever. I, would I, I have I have deep respect for the supernatural. I I respect it and I, I, I would never turn it into a game. It's not a parlor trick. It's, you know, it, it's it's much much deeper, more poignant than that to me. And I, I worry about people who jump on a Ouija board because I think there is stuff out there like your friend like bah, hitting his head. And th I've, I've heard a lot of experiences about that uh, kind of thing. Can I ask a question about this ghost? Yeah. Was, did they look, did she look like we portray ghosts in Hollywood or uh, was she like ethereal? Could you see through her? That's one question. Two, was she in color black and white and i and i it reminds me of like i was talking to your daughter and my and my daughters about when they were little and they were in the car and they were like was when you were a kid was the world in black and white and i'm like <laughs> why and they're like well i we the pictures we saw were they were black and white so were you black and white and i'm like that's such a Interesting question. So, so I have that question. Um, was she in black and white? Or was she, she obviously she was in color, right? 
she was in color and i would say you know it was a long time ago it was you know she was relatively translucent she wasn't a solid figure it wasn't like skin you know it was it was a bit translucent by the way and she just walked past it wasn't like could you you hear the footsteps nope nope i just felt the presence that's it yeah okay yeah. I have a very close, one of my closest friends from, um, uh, we went to high school together and we went to the same college together and he's no longer with us. Uh, it was probably like 15 years ago. I lost him. I don't remember dreams a lot. Like I, I wake up, I just don't have a lot of dreams that I remember, but I really remember in the last like 10 years, three or four times waking up, having felt like I spent time with him Mm. yeah, in like a, like a real way. Like, like I felt like I had hung out with him. Right. And it's, it's not something that I could describe as being like, you know, it happened in black and white or we said this and I hear his voice. I just had a feeling like we had a hang Mm -hmm. and it stayed with me for like, you know it stays with you for a couple days like it's like when you miss someone and then you hang out with them you don't miss them as much afterwards for the time and then time goes by and then you miss them and i could only describe it as being real right right well professional mediums say that that's how a lot of spirits connect with us is through our dreams right and through electricity you know tv's coming on and off suddenly lights flashing on and off, that kind of thing. Electricity is like a, a means of communication. So. I, w- I went through, um, this just happened this week. We got a new puppy and um, it's, it's such a trip in a weird way. Uh, and there's, my family is, I describe it like when we sit down at the dinner table and someone says, how was your day? We all start talking at once because everybody wants to mic. It's like me and my wife and my two kids. Oh, and so naming this puppy was like i think it might be easier to get a bill passed in congress <laughs> it was like there was so much back and forth over what this puppy should or should not be named everyone had very strong opinions i had a dream four days before the puppy arrived and i wanted to name the puppy because when i woke up it was so clear to me what we should name this puppy because my old dog that I had for 10 years, who was named Jackpot, was a, a street dog, a German Shepherd street dog who had epilepsy. And I spent thousands of dollars on his hip dysplasia and his ACL surgeries. So he was ironically named Jackpot. He was <laughs> like a mess. And this new dog that we have, this sweet little puppy who's in this next room, I knew was going to be a very sweet, chill dog. So yeah. Jackpot in my dream came to me and said, name this dog Ruckus. Right. And I was like, Ruckus, it's I such a it. negative. And, and Jackpot was saying, I was Jackpot and it was ironic and funny. Right. This dog's going to be cool and chill. So right. name it Ruckus. I made the mistake. And this is why I say it was like so political and getting a bill passed through Congress. I wanted to own this name and bringing it to my family. So I texted my wife with the dream leverage. Like I said, I just had a dream and my old dog told me to name the puppy Ruckus. And she immediately said, no, we're not naming the puppy Ruckus. (laughs) And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I have this feeling like I spent time with Jackpot and he told me, I don't do this a lot, Allie. He told me to name this dog. So she goes, we'll bring it to the table. So I went to the uh, tail waggers, the the pet store, and I had name tags printed out that said Ruckus with my phone number on the back. Like I was selling this hard. And what I realized in any situation When you go to a meeting, when you go to a a family event, when you go to something and you really want uh, something to be the outcome, people react in the opposite way just based on your energy. Yeah. So I said to my daughter, I want to name the dog Ruckus. She starts crying. My son (laughs) walks out of the room. (laughs) The more I wanted to do something based on this real feeling, the less it happened. So, I you know, I actually cry. No, like, like it's so good. It's just a trip. So Cute. I had to give up on it. We ended up naming the dog Bootsy. 
because it's got you know white Ooh, little boots sweet. on. God. Yeah, maybe it needs a but, middle name. Ruckus. Bootsy Ruckus. Bootsy, boots, boots, boots. <laughs> Bootsy Ruckus is a cool name. Bootsy by itself, I don't. I, I think you need to do something about that. But Bootsy Ruckus, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, again, it, it, it was a compromise because no, I couldn't I know. bring You're my dream. No bird. I get it. I have a family, two kids. I get outnumbered all the time. You need to build alliances prior to that meeting, which you know can be done with uh, with children, with with like candy and you know, Pay out. yeah, money and whatever. You know? I, I I I did. Do, I mean, we can we can dovetail this into parenting, but I did try that. Jay, yeah. I had my son alone in the car and I shared the story about the dog and I said, listen, I'm going to bring this up. You're on my side. We're naming it Ruckus. And he's like, what's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> he's negotiating. <laughs> it is Congress. <laughs> it's Congress. Uh, Kristen, can you, I don't know this story, but how did you end up in California in show business? And what was it? I, you came in your early 20s, right? I came at 19 to wow. the land of milk and honey. Yes. Um, I have, uh, I mean, I, I have a circuitous path. I, I grew up in New Mexico. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, so I've got some Midwest roots. Then my mom and my dad got divorced. When I was about eight and a half, we moved to New Mexico, and it was just me and my mom. So, uh, you know kind of survivalist. Um, my mom was part of like the first wave of women, you know, working in the professional world, like only woman in the room type stuff. And when I was when I was a teenager, well, I, I was a latchkey kid, so I spent a lot of time with the TV. Like TV, basically when, you know, in our generation, if like babysitters were obsolete once you could make your own peanut butter and jelly, right? So it's like once yeah. I was 10, storytelling, TV, that kind of thing, and and music became my babysitter because I was alone. Um, and the times that my mom and I would really connect deeply and really laugh and cry together because she was super stressed out a lot um, were the times when we would watch a movie together. And it's like all the great movies from that era, like Tootsie and Postcards from the Edge and Ordinary People and, you know, I mean, just yeah. some great. Films, Kramer versus broad, Kramer and Kramer versus Kramer. Oh, broadcast news. Um, and so I just had the vi these vivid memories of those watching those movies with my mom and feeling such a catharsis um, together. And I had I just had the feeling I need to be a part of that, creating that experience for people. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the jobs are called. I'm 15. All I know is I need to be a part of that experience. And so when I was 19, I you know, packed up my my car, my Nissan, and and came to LA. And uh, I was really fortunate to have, I had a grandfather who had a huge influence on my life. He was really my best friend. And he taught me two things that were crucial to me making it to Los Angeles and actually, you know, not ending up dead in a ditch. Um, and that was, um, he taught me how to drive. He taught me the love of, of a car. Um, and I had a driver's license when I was 14 years old, 14 <laughs> and months, because New Mexico is a farming state. And, yeah. and so they give you license really early there. So at 14 and nine months, I had a red MG and my grandpa was like, you are going to drive this and, and you are going to take road trips. And we would go on road trips all the time. So he really taught me like the love of the road and not to be afraid to just drive, just yeah. go. And then he also, he was a bar fly and so he, as a kid, I just was always with him in bars. I'd be, it didn't matter, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, whatever. He'd just put me on the stool next to him and and we would make friends with everybody at the bar. And he taught me not to be afraid of strangers, uh, the opposite of what most parents teach their children. And so the idea of like just moving to Los Angeles, getting my car and go, just it was not a, people say, oh, that was so brave. You didn't know anybody. Like, it didn't feel brave. I had been trained for it, basically. So yeah. I came out. I, I knew one person. She, she I only knew her a little bit. She was an actress at the time. Now she's a casting director. Um, and she let me stay on her couch a couple of weeks. And then next thing I knew, we were in this in this great club. It was called the China Club. It was on Sunset Boulevard. Um, 
And on Tuesday nights, they played Bruce Springsteen music. It was called Boss Boss Club on Tuesday nights. And uh, Suzanne, who let, was letting me crash on her couch, she she and I went to this club and we were just dancing. And I was a pretty crazy dancer uh, um, back then. And these two women came up to me and said, I found out later, they said to each other, she looks fun. Let's go invite her over. So they basically came over and and introduced themselves and we danced together and, and they invited me to their house up in Laurel Canyon. And I went with them to basically the after party. Meanwhile, I'm 19. Um, they're in their, they're 30 at this point. They're 10 years older than I am. And they invite me over and we go over and I walk into this house in Laurel Canyon. And I, I guess again, that, that sixth sense feeling, I just walked into the house and I felt like, oh my God, this is, I'm supposed to live here. Like this is this is home. This is my home. It was a very weird feeling. It was a really cool house in Laurel Canyon. And um, a couple months later, one of them called me and said, "Do you want to move in? We've we've got room now." And so I moved into this house, and that became my my home base. It, it was everything for me for for through my twenties in Los Angeles, and you know basically became friends with everybody on this street. It was just like this great collection of people. It was really like the show Friends, basically. Um, nobody locked their doors. It was like six, seven houses. Everybody shared, you know, there was, each house was like, had different levels and there were probably like 15 of us. And- uh, What street in Laurel Canyon? Um, it was Lookout Mountain. Oh, got it, okay. Off, off Lookout Mountain. Yeah. And, um, and, it, and that's where I met Jen. So one day, I think it was nine, I, I had been in LA maybe 10 months. Jen, Jen is Jennifer Aniston. My friend, my dear friend and partner in crime. And uh, we uh, uh, we were having a barbecue and she, uh, another good friend of mine, Meredith, had gone to high school with her, with Jen, and she brought her over for a barbecue. And I remember I was defrosting chicken in the microwave, which was a really bad idea because I, I overcooked it. And I turned around and she walked in and and we had this like very kind of neat, cute, romantic comedy encounter of like, I she felt so familiar and like, where have you been all my life? Um, she says I look like one of her, her aunts, her young aunt. Um, and we just immediately bonded and she was just visiting from New York. And basically my friends and I on this street convinced her to stay in LA instead of going back to New York. And uh, yeah, and that's that's how that piece of my life kind of took off. I had just, we had the best time, best era up there. We had so many great friends and those were the days when like, you know, we didn't have kids. We didn't, you know, we were renting uh, these apartments basically. And we would just stay up all night and talk. You know, it's like that was that era where you, the the depths of your bond, it was just the hanging out time was so unique. And when you're in the middle of it, you don't even realize how, how, how great beautiful it is. it is. And yeah. Yeah. And how it's not going to be like this later. You know, there's there are other chapters that are equally as beautiful and interesting, but there's just something about your 20s that Oh, love. Well, that that speaks to your twenties, but it also speaks something that I really, really value. There's and it's a lost art, and I don't think it's as emphasized enough anymore. But it's it's neighbors, you know, people who are in your immediate vicinity, yeah. and you you speak with and you interact with with no agenda, yeah, other than being in the same proximate place with them on the same street, end up becoming some of your closest and more form formative relationships in your life just by virtue of you being there and this person's there because there's a sense of trust to it like you didn't move somewhere to meet someone and i always every neighbor i have this is I'll, I'll, i this is something i'll take pride in for a second i still talk to and i i keep up with even though i've moved from multiple neighborhoods all over los angeles and and different cities I still keep up with those relationships because I can check in on them and and shoot them a text or share them a video of somewhere I'm at. And it's it's like a timeless interaction. You know, like I don't have to give it right. down. It's like, and it, you know, this is, it's in the Bible. Like, love your neighbor. Like, it's like the oldest, it's like, so yeah, we're going a little biblical. Like, 
people figured out the value of that for a long time. And one of the most crushing things for me during, um, you know, whatever we went through the last couple of years, the pandemic or the lockdown was you could not see your neighbors. You were almost forced to be, it cut you off in a big way, you know, and I was lucky to live in a, a neighborhood with houses um, and not like being, I grew up in an apartment building in Chicago, which I think would be even more isolating being in an apartment and not wow. being able to talk to your neighbor or reach right. out to your neighbor, like feeling you were cut off from that. And yeah, it's just a very real, it's a very real connection. So for you to meet a friend like that at that time is kind of how yeah. it works. I mean, yeah. I think that's so cool. Uh, it's funny because I have a real fear, not fear of neighbors, but I have a fear my neighbor won't work out. And then I'll be stuck in this relationship <laughs> with a neighbor and I'm like, oh, small talk. You I've already small let them talk. in and now we're, now I got to, I mean, in fact, I had a neighbor, um, I, you know, I lived in Laurel Canyon too, uh, probably a, a, 10 years after that, that era. But, uh, uh, I lived way up on, uh, I won't name the street because the neighbor across the street was a sort of a younger woman. Maybe she was probably 35 and she was living with a dude who was, I guess probably 68 or so. And they had a really nice pool, which they used to rent out to porn shoots. Um, and the <laughs> woman was, you know, she was- You're a really good neighbor, Jay. Well, you keep coming over. <laughs> well, right. And so I'm like, you know, I'm, you know, there's all these production vehicles up there and they're shooting porn. And, and my wife, who was friends with, with Kristen, uh, had moved to LA at the time. And she was, she was we were living together. But this woman across the street kept coming on to me. And I was like, I don't know. I just, uh... and so this hey, is what. Hey, can you deliver the, can you deliver this pizza real quick? <laughs> just after we moved out of that house, the 68 year old kind of lost it. And they had to go up with a straight jacket and put them in and drag them out of there to the fucking loony bed. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. But so, how, but how did you make the jump, Kristen, from wanting to be in show business, hanging around with all these people in Laurel Canyon to being a writer? To being a writer. Well, I I had a lot of chutzpah, I guess. Um, and when I came to LA, I had the name of a producer. I didn't know this person. They didn't know me, but I had a name. And when you've got nothing, a name is so valuable, right? Yeah. Like I thought I had gold. I was carrying gold. I had a name. And I tracked this person down and I called him literally for 30 days in a row. I was on his call sheet. Now, and now I understand it was a call sheet. Um, uh, I would leave a message with his assistant. And finally on literally about the 30th day, this guy picks up the phone and he's like, who are you? And why do you keep calling me? <laughs> and I know I've got like 20 seconds and I basically say, I'm new to town. I don't know anyone. I'm desperate for a job. I'm just wondering if I could please come in and meet you. And he's like, all right, you can come in. I'll give you five minutes. And he said to me on the phone, if you're not a crazy person, uh, maybe I'll help you get one interview. I was like, great. So I show up. He literally meets me in the hallway. He meets me in the hallway. And I just tell him a little bit about myself. You know, I'm, I'm here. I just moved here from New Mexico. I don't know anyone. I heard your name. I was working at PBS running camera. And I and I heard, overheard your name. And you're a big producer. And, and he just was like, all right, listen, I I'll get you one interview. But that's it. Like, Okay. And I said, great. So he got me an interview on for a writer director on Cheers. He worked on Cheers. We worked on Dear John. He was one of the great comedy writers of all time. His name was Bob Ellison. And I come to this interview on Par on the Paramount lot, which already I feel like I've won the lottery. Like I could go home at that point. I was Incredible. like, I made, I, made, Incredible. I made it on the Paramount lot. I'm like, yeah. I'm tingling. My whole body is just like vibrating. I'm like, I, I've done it. I've lived the dream. And I I am the first person in line. So I I meet this guy, Bob. I'm so excited. You know, he's like one of the big comedy writers. I go in and for the for the interview, I'm so nervous. And he is literally the least funny person I've ever met. He he's he's like depressed. He won't even he barely speak. And it I had to like kick into like my own I started interviewing him, basically and uncovered that he was going through a divorce and he was really depressed. He was a depressed comedy writer. And I, whatever I said to him about divorce, 
I had been through a few divorces with my mom. My mom and dad have both been married and divorced four times, happens to be one of my subjects of expertise. This was his first divorce after 35 years of marriage. Whatever I said to counsel him at the ripe age of 19, he basically said to me at the end of, end of our 20 minutes together, whatever, he's like, listen, I'm going to give you this job. I'm going to hire you. <laughs> but I now have to interview all 20 people in line out there because Paramount is a union and I've got to interview everybody. So I think he told me that like, as in like, you 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 owe me, you better be a good fucking assistant. <laughs> That and that and that began um, a beautiful, fruitful mentorship that I am so grateful for to this day. I've never had a female mentor, but Bob was a great mentor to me, and uh, that gave me access to the set. I was suddenly on a set with Woody Harrelson and Ted Danson. I was like, it, you know, it was it was mind blowing just being and and Jimmy Burroughs, like just just being with these geniuses, uh -huh. watching them yeah. work. And, um, and, and he, Bob did something else incredible for me. I ended up getting into film school right around like a month later after I got this job, which was a miracle. I had applied to USC film school and I came home one day and got a letter. I'd been accepted. And I was like, oh shit, I can't go to school. Like I got accepted, but I can't go. I have a job. And I went to Bob and I said, I know this is a lot to ask, but is there any way you'd let me out at six o'clock? Monday through Thursday, and I will work all night Friday because it was our tape night. I'm there for you until the bitter end. And he thankfully said yes. And so I went to film school. I worked for him for three and a half years, I think. And I went to film school at night at USC for those three and a half years. Ah, and then okay. went one semester during the day. So I was like a vampire student of USC. Oh, cool. That the one name the one connection and then the moment of meeting someone where they were just a little vulnerable and you were open to hearing their story led to your career, right? Yeah. And, and the best part about that is, uh, but so my, my job every morning was to come in, bring Bob coffee, like a good assistant and back in the day, especially, um, we, I think assistants had just been, uh, upgraded from secretaries. Um, and, uh, and we would have basically counseling we would talk about how he was feeling, how he was doing. Like I was kind of a pseudo there, you know, therapeutic conversation. And I, and, and thankfully like three years later, he and his wife got back together. So like he made it through and then they were, they repaired and got back together. Went back to Shawshank. And good love story. I went back to Shawshank. <laughs> no wonder you don't love your neighbors, Jay. You're so cynical. <laughs> Back to John Shanks. <laughs> you know, you were talking about the shows that you grow up on. You mentioned all those great uh, the, the movies from the day for me. And it was, I think, maybe we're just a product of uh, this era where the TV was your babysitter and you didn't have a lot of options. Whatever was on the TV is what you watched. Yeah. And for me, it was the show Family Ties. Mm -hmm. And it was at the time when it was like a weird glitch in the Matrix where Family Ties was on prime time. But they, the show was so beloved that they aired it like right before at this like weird hour where, where it, like, it was like a block of Family Ties episodes. And, you know, it was like in perpetuity that show was out there living. And I watched Family Ties um, and all of those characters and the stories. And, you know, it's actually like a super relevant thing with it. It's like, I think the premise was like a liberal parents and a conservative son. You know, and that was the crux of all the stories. So I watched that show um, just, you know, like, like with my face two inches from the TV. And when I got to town, one of my first jobs was working with uh, a writer friend of mine, Scott Silveri, who's married to Shauna Goldberg Miam, and her father created that show. Sure. So I would always love hearing stories about, I was working on a sitcom and I loved hearing stories about how that show, because she, she grew up on the set of that show and it really was a family, right? Like your dad's working the, all long hours and you're a kid on that set and you get to do it for 10 years or however long that show is on. And that made me feel a connective tissue to being a kid in front of the boob tube and then being like working on a set was like the connective right. tissue there for me. It was really cool to be part of. 
That's Kristen, cool. Yeah. I have some I have some story questions that, that I know about you that I want to hear about. Mm. Um, so the first one is, is what can you tell me about the soap opera as the hill turns? Mm. Good trivia question. Uh, well, Jen Aniston and I were um, friends when she had like packing boxes as her furniture, right? So this was pre-friends. Um, this was, these were leaner times and she would sit on my couch actually in Bob Ellison's office at Paramount, um, wondering what she was going to do with her life. And, uh, she had so much magic and charisma in her at 19 that it was, it, there was no, no one was worried. Let's just put it that way. But she really felt like I don't know how to do anything. She was she was not a great waitress, and that was her only fallback at that point. And and so she was like, "This is it for me. It's kind of do or die." And so we used to sit around and talk about like one day when we are like in charge and we're making stuff and doing stuff. Um, our big dream was to to make a soap opera. We were like, "We are gonna make the best soap opera," and we we called it As the Hill Turns, and it was basically based on our lives um, because we had a lot of funny, crazy shit happen up on that hill and a lot of drama, a lot of friend dynamics, a lot of people coming and going. Um, hookups. And hookups. Oh, yeah, there's a lot. There are a lot of stories. And um, the irony is then one day I came home and again, we didn't, we, nobody locked their doors. So I lived like at that point, I moved up and down that street multiple times as did Jen, actually. So I was living a couple doors down and I came over and there was a yellow envelope, a manila envelope at her doorstep and I picked it up and opened it. I mean, these are the kind of the intimacy that we all shared. You opened each other's mail without even thinking. <laughs> I literally opened the mail. I come running up the stairs and I say, oh, you you have, you know, you have an audition for friends like us. Um, and that was her audition for the show, which she... Uh, after she shot the pilot, she still thought, well, at least I shot a pilot. Like n nobody ever expected, you know, you know, when you're actors back then, especially you were so excited to get a pilot. The, yeah. The, incredible. The, the idea of getting a series that was ongoing was like a whole other, you know, ball game. But so we were celebrating the fact that she got a pilot and, and I just remember her thinking, you know, that's all it's going to be, but that's okay. Like I'm in the game. It's such a lark, isn't it? That w when there used to be that pilot season and you'd be excited just to work and you would, there was no rhyme yeah. or reason to it. I had friends and, you know, one person would get on a show and you do this one pilot and then maybe that one would go, but that was the show that nobody wanted to be on. And then that was the one that ended up working out. Like there was, I, I've always felt the things that are the most certain in the entertainment industry are the ones that don't work out. Yeah. Like when it's all lined up, you know, it kind of is like a little more larky. I mean, I that cast of friends, if I remember correctly, they put together that group of people. And by the way, Shauna and Scott wrote on that show for the, a long time. They all were actors. It was at the end of pilot season when it was being cast and they were in the mix of of pilots and that show was like the last one to be filled out uh -huh. and it ends up like living in perpetuity it's yeah it's crazy yeah it's crazy it is it's wild i think the only person who knew for sure was jimmy burrows he and he had done enough shows at that point to have a, a pretty strong sixth sense about it and there's a great story where he he took the whole cast this was before the show aired right before the show aired he took the whole cast of vegas on a private plane I think it was and they were complete unknowns not nobody knew who anyone was except maybe someone would recognize Courtney Cox from that Bruce Springsteen video yeah. like that and he drops them he brings them to a hotel in Vegas and he gives them each like I don't know 500 bucks or some some amount of money and he's like go have fun you guys and enjoy your anonymity while you still have it and and they <laughs> had yeah. fun weekend in Vegas and his premonition came true. Wow. 
So wow. I, I'll just bridge. I want to bridge into your experience on the morning show because I, I'm going to correct myself. Something I said like 30 seconds ago where things that are supposed to line up and work uh, don't usually happen. But I think the exception is the morning show because <laughs> <laughs> hey. that was, that was, it, it you know, I, I, I well, we uh, stacked, got to. We stacked it, the deck. Hayes, we stacked the deck on that one. I mean, right. The deck was very right, but you know, that's still not a guarantee in, in television and, and entertainment. For me, it was the, I, you know, I early on in the first season, um, I got to appear, I think I auditioned for the pilot of the morning show and had a panic attack because you get, you get material and it was like 15 pages of straight monologues. And I like to go in. Did you audition for Corey? Yeah. You did? Yes, I auditioned for it. Corey in the beginning. I, I talked to Billy Croup about this, actually. And, you know, wow. the, the way that... And I ended up coming on to the show later for uh, an episode at the end. And even that experience uh, of just getting the job because I had been put through the ringer of memorizing 15 pages of dialogue and having to do it like front to back in one take. Right. You know, not on the show, but just in the right. room when you're trying to get it, like no. you just don't mess that stuff up. It like brought me back to theater school. Like, you know, no. you just, you just go and, and do it and you have to be off book and you have to. Do so by the time I got to set, I wasn't a lot of times I'll step on the set. I'll be nervous when I'm working with, actors that I've seen right. do a lot of work because yeah but it was such a grueling process to get the job that I was like it can't get more pressure than that like, oh my I'm god I'm just here for the party like that must have been the hardest official audition ever because Carrie Aaron who wrote who wrote the scripts uh for season one and two and and she you know she had a team of writers but it was really her brainchild um Corey was like it was her stream of consciousness. And I've never seen monologues that are harder. Even Billy, you know, he I'm sure he told you, like, it is not easy being Corey. Well, you have to have no, I mean, it, it, no. you're you're examining a world of high pressure stakes and, and the, the the feeling and energy that you're putting across is people don't stop to to they just go. It was like a David Mamet. Yeah. It was like a Mammoth or something. You know, like it's overlapping. It's it's so fiery. And usually yeah. television shows, I think the unique thing about the morning show is it's very verbose, right? Yeah. Like it's a lot of it is dialogue. Uh, it's a, and that's just the way it exists. And you've got these incredible actors who are able to deliver that in an amazing way and still tell a story. But it's not like long pauses and, and montages. It's like a filmed play. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That moves very fast. Yeah. Very fast. And it was fun. I, you were Marlon. You were a great Marlon. And you had to do something that really is one of the hardest things an actor has to do on camera, which is have a glass of water thrown in your face without flinching, without anticipating. <laughs> one of the keys to acting is to never anticipate. But when you know that you're about to be hit by Jennifer Aniston, with a glass of water in your face, I can't. I, I kudos to you because you really did. Uh, Kristen, it's really funny you brought up that moment because the director, uh, the great Mimi leader, I, I pop onto the show to do a couple scenes, and in the script, I didn't know what the tone of the show was. Uh -huh. I just knew the actors on it, and every actor on it, from Steve Carell to Reese Witherspoon to Jennifer, Ann, they could be super, super funny. Right. Or super super dramatic. They're very so. I, yeah, yeah. You don't. But and before the show had came out, there was no reference point, right? Yep. So in the script, I think it was written that uh, I got my I, I got spit. She spits in my yep. face. Yeah. And it was I, I'm like ready for that to happen. It's kind of a, a weird thing to have you know uh, Jennifer Aniston spit in your face, and she said uh, I would love that before. Well, you just it's on the page. You got to <laughs> do it. And she, she said, uh, and I went at Mimi Leader said, she, we're not going to spit in your face. It, you know, Jen doesn't want to do it. It feels too, it, it feels too uh, uh, virile. Yeah, vulgar. 
And then I said, I what there. if she just threw a cup of, yeah, what if, what if, you're like, what if you just throw a cup of water in his face? Yeah, <laughs> was yeah. Like, it, was a, it was really good, a really good solution. And um, yeah, you were just great because you, you played the guy who's like the frat boy who's brought in to like be the Band-Aid producer, you know, be the step into this very intense, dramatic, emotional moment on the heels of, of a woman dying, you know, of, of, of a death. And your character has to step in and uh, run the show. No one knows him. No one respects him. He's kind of like a little douchey, um, but trying to do the job. And oh, it was just so you, you played it beautifully. Um, Did you guys base that was the idea of the colonel for that show? Because it came kind of at the same time at the Matt Lauer scandal, right? Is, yeah, it, w- it, it was, was around it, that time. Media figures. It was around that time. I mean, it was after that. The thing is, it it was it was inspired by a book by Brian Stetler, and um, that's really where the idea came from. And Michael Ellenberg about the behind the uh, yeah the behind the, the scenes, scenes of a morning, morning show, world. yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. And Michael Ellenberg, who's a, a producer, brilliant guy, um, reached out to both us and Reese's team, Reese and her team, and. It just seemed, you know, Jen and Reese were looking for some, had been for a while. We'd all been kind of like, there's got to be something great out there for them to do together. And um, this was just an obvious, amazing piece for, for the two of them. So it really was based, inspired by this book. And then, um, you know, the thing is, sadly, that that character that Steve Grell played is, is an amalgamation of many, many accounts, many experiences. We did a lot of we talked to a lot of people around the morning show world. And unfortunately, there were a lot of people to examples to pull from, you know? I mean, it was just Matt if only Matt Lauer were a one off and it was a, an anomaly. Um, but it just wasn't. So um it, it's really profound when each time we make a season or, you know, episodes are airing, we we get a lot of secret texts uh or calls from people who work in the morning show world just saying like what the hell? Do you have cameras? Do you have do you have <laughs> microphones yeah. in our in our control room in my dressing room? This this show is freaking me out. <laughs> how accurate it is. So, well, do you feel like from season to season when you know you 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 ballpark it and you, you've got such great performers and great writing? Do you feel is there like a pressure to live up to it every time yes. you're at work? Like it's almost like. Yeah. You're playing in a great band and you wrote a hit song and now you've got to come up with like five more yeah, it top is. 40 songs. <laughs> like it's, it's it a is. different way to it really, create. It is really stressful. And, you know, this season was making this season was a, a particular high wire act because Carrie Aaron, who'd written the first two seasons, decided to to step off. And we brought in a new showrunner who was amazing. But she's new to the show, right? And we've done two seasons together. It's been four long years because of COVID and and some other issues with season one. It just each season took about twice as long as TV seasons are supposed to take. So we had all been in the trenches together for a long time. So yeah, we starting season three was like, can we can we can we match? Can we do you know what we what we've done for two seasons? Uh, making the show is as stressful as what's on the screen you know what i mean like energy i remember jen and i went to like i think it was i think it was the day show i believe it was the day show we went to their their we went to new york to do research um and we went into the control room and walking into the control room as a morning show is happening live is is literally like stepping into um a rocket launch control room the um, you you would think that lives are at stake the amount of stress the amount of like the amount of like foot tapping foot tapping it the add in the room was on fire i i was like they're literally doing a morning show and these people are stressed chomping on gum drinking coffee like it was so intense and and so the show itself behind the scenes is is about that intense too it really is for those five months when we're shooting we are all jacked up on adrenaline plus you're dealing with giants like you know like when i when i when i direct an actor you know most of them will just do what i said 
occasionally you'll run into one of those fucking mo- those big fucking people who are, who are like, I'm not reading that line. And you're like, yeah, no. what? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, and the, like, and you got five, four or five of them up there who are like, I'm not going to do yep. that. And you're like, uh, <laughs> we built a whole yep. story around it. Uh, okay, yep. let's go. Let's shut it down. Let's go get the trailers. We'll rewrite this fucking thing. And you're like, God. yeah, yeah. That does happen frequently, and it, our show is oh, because if it's not working on its feet, you can you have the well, yeah. luxury of like let's just break this down and think about it for a second. Because yeah, you have to that's... well, and literally for a second, yeah, for for about twelve yeah. seconds, you get to try and solve it and rewrite it. Yep, it's happened multiple times, um, for sure. Uh, and our show, more than any show I've experienced, is very like it's it's an experiment in democracy, which we all know is very messy. Um, you know, it it really is a democratic experience of like everybody kind of has a vote, and and, uh, and yeah, there's a lot of there are a lot of creative giants on that show who have really strong opinions, and in in the mix and messiness and debate that goes on, you know, out of that comes what you see on screen. Uh, can I ask you this? Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end, but I, I'm just curious. Can you tell me the Departed story? How you ended up a producer on the Departed? Oh my gosh! Yes, I don't think I've ever actually told the story. Um, uh, I started Plan B, uh, this production company that was originally called Block before it became Plan B with Jen Aniston and Brad Pitt, and. We started it in my garage in Ojai. That was like where my office was. That was those were headquarters, and we optioned a few things. And uh, the the couple of the things we we started optioning first were like love stories, and and I was new. I was new to this whole producing thing. You know, I had actually written two books before that and made a documentary, so I was really an odd choice to be running this company. Honestly, I was like. Uh, a very left field choice, but Jen and I and Brad and I had a lot of trust and we loved the same movies and Brad and I really connected um, on, you know, the, our love for movies, the kind of directors we loved, all that sort of thing. So I, in my, all my wisdom of not ever running a company before, I thought, well, there's, there's, we've got a lot of feminine kind of things, you know, like a lot of love stories. We like time traveler's wife, we had just optioned and and I felt like we need a guy's movie, you know, or else I'm going to look like I don't know what I'm doing. Like we need one guy movie. So I I was reading The Hollywood Reporter and I read this uh, review of a movie called Infernal Affairs, which was a Hong Kong action thriller. And the, the review was short. It was like a paragraph or two, but it talked about this existential dilemma between a mafia guy and a cop and how they you know, it kind of alluded to the fact that they wanted, they each wanted to be each other, right? They wanted to basically switch lives. And I thought, well, that sounds fascinating. That sounds interesting. Maybe I should, again, I was figuring out how to be a producer and how to be a, a head of a company. I was like, maybe I should see this movie. And so I, I called around and uh, somebody told me, yeah, call this guy Roy Lee. He's like the, the gatekeeper of, of any movie coming out of Asia. Uh, Hong Kong, the whole area. I was like, really? Okay. So I call this guy Roy Lee and I say, hey, I just read this interview about this this movie, Infernal Affairs. Are you? Do you have access to it? Do you have it? To this day, I I don't know if, if he if this is true or if this was just a great response. Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, same outcome. But he said, yeah, yeah, I'm getting that movie in about. It's going to be here in about four or five days. Uh, and I said, okay. He said, so come to my, literally come to my office and we'll watch it. So I go to this guy's, I go to this guy, Roy Lee's office. This and guy had never seen it. Didn't know what was going on. I don't think so. I think he looked like, up. He's yeah, like, I got it. what's this random company? What is, it's Brad Pitt's fucking, and Jen Anderson have a company. And this girl from Ojai is calling me like, what is this? So I go to his office and we literally put a VHS tape in a freaking player and watch it on his TV. And there are subtitles, but they go by so fast. You, I had to pause it like a hundred times just to read the dialogue. Um, but it was really well made, you guys. Like having more experience now than I had then in comparison, it was a really cool movie. 
Um, and it held together. A lot of movies out of Hong Kong like have a good beginning or a middle or an end. Yeah. This actually like, had a structure to it. And the essence of the character dynamics were so great. And the acting was phenomenal. I was just like, well, I don't really know enough, but I think this is fucking an amazing movie. So I said to, so I said to this guy, Roy, can you get me a print of this movie? And he was like, of course, that, you know, calls his guys working the phones, get, getting that print. And I, I had the chutzpah back then. I don't know. It's like when you're younger, you have some, you have guts. And I basically just, I told Brad Pitt, I want to show you this movie and let's bring the head of Warner Brothers in and let's screen it together. And so the head of Warner Brothers, the president of Warner Brothers came. Brad brought Guy Ritchie with him just for fun, just to like get Guy's opinion on it. And the four of us watched the movie and it was fucking awesome. And the, the, the sub, we could read the subtitles in the big screen. And we finished it. And uh, I said, now, why don't you tell, tell Jeff, the head of Warner Brothers, that we, we want to do, he was like, I love it. It's great. And Guy Ritchie was like pretty impressed. He was like, it's a really good movie. You should do it. So I said, why don't you tell, tell Jeff we want to do it, but you know, that you're not going to be in it. Because we got to, we need to be a legitimate production company. We were already starting to develop stuff for him, stuff for Jen. Like we need something that's just us as producers, right? And this is a really commercial movie, so they don't, we don't need him necessarily in it, right? So uh, he, so Brad tells Jeff that, and Jeff's disappointed that he's not getting a Brad Pitt action thriller, clearly, but he can't say no. It's Brad, so he's like, all right. So he does fine. Then I find this, I start reading scripts. I've been reading tons of scripts. I had, Jay knows my husband, Charlie. Charlie and I had just lived in Boston right before this whole production company thing happened. I, Charlie and I had lived in Boston for a year and I was reading all these articles about Whitey Bulger, who's this this maniac, you know, fucking mafia dude. Bo Boston gangster, right? Boston gangster. And so now we had to decide where do we set this movie, right? And I was like, I think we have to set it in Boston. Um, the Sopranos was on the air. Like we got to distinguish this movie. Yeah. And I want to want it to feel real, you know. So I was like, let's set it in Boston. Um, and so then I started looking for writers who could write Boston, right? Who can really? I mean, this is like the language. The this this is real street Boston. This is not bullshit. Like Hollywood writer version of Boston. Yeah, yeah. The right? south. You want south southy shit. Yeah, this is deep shit. I lived in Inman Square. It's like, it's that way. And 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 I found this guy, Bill Monahan, who was from Boston. And he had written, he was the beginning of his career. He had written one amazing script that I thought was fantastic. So I asked Brad to meet with him, with me. Uh, I met with him once. I was blown away. Brad met with him with me. And I said, listen, Warner Brothers is not going to want to hire Bill Monahan. Nobody really knows who he is, right? They're going to want to hire a big writer. And they did. They wanted to hire, two, there was a $2 million writer they wanted to hire. And I said, but if you say it's Bill, they'll say fine. And so he did. He he backed it. He was like, Bill's writing the script. And we hired William Monahan. <laughs> and, and he wrote the first draft in about three weeks. I don't know how the fuck he did it. But he wrote the draft in three weeks and sent it. And I had, again, I was very new. This was like the first year of my development career as a producer. I hadn't read many drafts that had come in, right, as first drafts. I'd read scripts people sent me that were probably the 10th draft. But I didn't know what if, I didn't have much to compare it to. But I read this first draft. And again, kind of like I felt when I saw Infernal Affairs, I was like, this is not my genre. I don't have a lot of experience. But I think this script is great. Like, I think it's fucking great. And so I give Bill notes. Our Warner Brothers executive gives Bill notes. He turns them around in a week and he sends me the script on a Friday. And um, on a Saturday, the Saturday, I get a call that Scorsese has read the script and he wants to direct the movie. Now, <laughs> nobody, nobody else in the company had even read the script. I was just developing it. It was like just a little thing that was being developed. And so it was like, of course, nine alarm fire alarm, like shit, uh, send the script. 
everybody needs to read it like emergency meeting you know like what's happening how did this like get out of how did this get so far ahead of us so everybody reads the script monday morning 8 a like seriously early meeting brad comes brad gray comes he's now a part of the company and we have like an all hands on deck meeting and by that time, which was already like 36 hours later, Scorsese, Scorsese had cast like five more roles. He had cast half the movie. Wow. And we were informed. Basically, we were on his movie now, right? <laughs> Scorsese, was, Scorsese was informing us of who had been cast thus far. Oh, my and, God. And the rest what of was the, the The story with the movie, people had said that uh, it's, there's a lot of the same shots as Infernal Affairs and The Departed. Mm -hmm. You know, having not seen the original movie, yeah, is that true? Like, yeah. did, yeah. The, did the movie you see on the little screen that you couldn't read the subtitles end up being very similar to what became Infernal Affairs? The Departed, very sin. Well, no, I mean Scorsese's is like the elevator scene with the the shocking with the the the, 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 the that stuff was yeah. in the original movie. Yeah. It was yes. wow. Yes. And Infernal Affairs was really cinematic. It was really well done. It, and so it was a great template for sure. But, you know, Scorsese, Scorsese, he he upgraded a few things. And by the way, I never got to work with Scorsese. This is the thing. Like, I was the midwife. I was the midwife of The Departed. I Then I handed that baby over. There was an adoption moment. And then it was like, this birth mother shall never contact us again. We're going to make the movie. <laughs> and that was it. And oh, some, and I, I learned a great lesson, though, in that, you guys. Sometimes, and this has borne out to be true in my 25 years doing this, sometimes you're an origin moment. Sometimes you're a midwife. Sometimes you're the mother parent of a movie. Sometimes you take it from beginning to end. It, it, the, it's a very, you have to be kind of, open, I think, to what role you're meant to play yeah, in any particular creative. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing about describing uh, the job of a producer to someone, right? Because it feels nebulous. People yeah. always ask, like, to hear that story is incredible to, to shepherd that story and get it in the right hands and then let it fly. And, and people say, like, if you're with a producer, it can get like, well, what, what do they do? Like, I, you know, it's all those different stages. It can take five different job descriptions, but you're just part of storytelling in some capacity. You know, it's a yeah, producers do whatever it takes to get the best possible story told. You That's summon it. you summoned that movie and and I did. You know, summoned it. Made it <laughs> something and then obviously right. look if Scorsese, you know, had wanted to take uh beer fest and make his own I'd be like, Yeah, go ahead, good luck. I'd love to watch it. I mean yeah. <laughs> You don't want me yeah. to pull? That's okay. Well, uh, well, Jay, that's like that's like Danny DeVito and and Jersey Films being a producer on Super Troopers, yeah. right? Wasn't it just like a they gave it a he gave it a little kiss in the beginning yeah. and and then it was just off in the ether? Like that's crazy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, anyway, I think we, I think we've we've overstayed our welcome. I we can't have. Believe so, so we're gonna we're gonna finish up with um, this podcast is. Uh, you know, sponsored by Vouch, this uh, app I've created to try to kill Rotten Tomatoes because I'm a vengeful and bitter man. Um, but you know, it's it's a it's a recommendation app for anything you love, uh, and it's from people you know, people you trust, people you know. Instead of like the writer at the Chicago Tribune, it's Hayes, right? So so I'm going to start the vouches off if you don't mind. Um, I was uh, I was with an editor uh, cutting. Um, I did a stand up special, and he had, you know, I didn't really know the guy. He's like, this is how this Hollywood thing is now. Like somebody edits your stand up special, then you go meet him for the first time, and you're like, I'm sitting in his house, his baby's downstairs, uh, and I saw this Michael Crichton book, Prey, on his bookshelf, and I was like, you know, I've read a lot of Michael Crichton books, um, and I'm I always learn. A, you know, learn a, a lot when you read Michael Crichton because he was like a science writer, but he's an incredible page turning novelist. And I'd never heard of the, of the movie Prey, but it, it happens to be about uh, nanotechnology in the lab that uh, escapes uh, and it's self replicating. Uh, and they keep trying to kill it, but they're unable to kill it. And it's after a certain, a certain prey, it has a certain prey. 
and we're the print. Uh, and so um, I've just started this book and it's just, you know, it's it's like as good as Congo, as good as Jurassic Park. It's just wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, vouch for this book, Pray by Michael Crichton. I love Michael it. Michael Crichton, what a ER. Didn't he write the original script for ER? Yeah. Like, yep. He's, he passed away. Did he pass he did. away? He passed he did. away. Yeah. And he's a, he's a prolific, amazing, amazing creator. Um, by the way, speaking of prolific, Jay, I cannot believe you added app creator to your extraordinarily <laughs> long list of talents. I just want to, can we just review this? Because it blows my mind. And every time I, I think about Jay, I'm just like, he's the most chill man on earth. And yet he gets more done than any oh, other yeah. human I know. You act, you direct, you write. You do stand up. You do political cartoons. You are a novelist. You're a memoir. I think. Did you finish your memoir? Yes, I did. It's published. Okay. The Wild Over the Tame. Okay. Now Good you're enough. an app creator. You're also could be a professional golfer and a ping pong player and maple <laughs> syrup. And the list just goes on. You are a true Renaissance man. I told you that by text this morning when you told me you were gonna bring up the app. I'm like what? Well, if 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 a brown man could blush, I would. But uh, I appreciate it. Um, but I will say this, you know, if you get on my bad side, I'm going to try to create an app to take you down. Uh, and so it's a spite. It's a spite store. You know, it's it's like uh, it's a spite store. Uh, and I, and I, I, I like I like it because you're forced to think about what you're into. And yeah. then you get to share it. Right. Yeah. Because like, there's so much that comes at you with products or shows or music and you get to just kind of note it this moment in time i saw this and i pinned it for me my vouch is um a ouija board <laughs> no, no i unvouch <laughs> hey i unvouch you <laughs> no my my vouch is i we were talking about tv and how you used to you know uh stumble upon shows and then look at them and i stumbled upon a documentary on hulu called the amazing jonathan and I love this documentary because it's essentially about a filmmaker who started to want to do uh, a documentary on this uh, magician who was facing terminal illness. So it was like the heydays of 80s uh, magic and the magic castle. And it was like a real look into that world. But like most great stories, and I love the, 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 the best documentaries, you're kind of discovering the story along with the filmmaker. And in the course of this documentary, I don't want to spoil it, but this documentary filmmaker realizes that the amazing Jonathan has given his life rights to three other filmmakers who are also doing a documentary on him. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he only so had a, a little bit to live. He had to make sure one of these films got made. That's right. He went and put all of his chips on the table and said, I want this documented, but it's it's a good one. It sounds good. Okay. Uh, I will watch that. Um, I would say I will vouch for a book that I love that really explains all the dynamics that of, of what women have lived through since the dawn of man and important for men to know it too. And it's a book called On Our Best Behavior, The Price Women Pay to Be Good uh, by Elise Lunen. It's a really good book. Um, Wait, is that, what's the, I'm like in already, what's the price? What's the thesis? <laughs> That basically the seven deadly sins, uh, it, it, it explains how historically the seven deadly sins have been ascribed to women through mostly through organized religion and have basically been hung on women um, in a way that leaves them with the burden um, to never be, you know, like sloth, all, all, all the, you know, things that the seven deadly sins represent that women basically carry the burden of this. And it really gets into the beautiful, like, the intricacies of, of historically how that happened, how it came to be, and how it has manifested in our culture today. I am excited. I, that sounds like a fantastic uh, way to tell a story, uh, because the seven deadly sins are are such an incredible part. I mean, a massive part of our culture. And you're like, I can see that. I'm excited to read that. Uh, what's yeah. the writer? Elise Lonen. Elise, Elise Lonen. Lonen. Okay, cool. And it hit the New York Times bestseller list, so I'm not the only one who likes it. Um, so. On our best behavior. Okay, great. 
Hey, yeah. Kristen, this was super fun. And um, uh, you're also, by the way, the first woman on the Mustache Tales podcast. Now that, that's not only, a, yeah, I mean, that's your, your number one. Um, you know, it's a new podcast. With a mustache. She started the podcast I, with, I like a that. with a mustache. That's the mustache. irony. I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out of this with Party Boy Mustache. And I'm just going to say it's been so fun hanging out with you guys and and I'm so glad you did. You finally, yes, you're having some women. I think this is a new, especially since we talked about that book. I think it's time for more women to be on your podcast. We love okay? it. <laughs> we love it. We're into it. Oh, I party love girl. Mustache party boy. Down here. <laughs> party boy mustache. Goodbye. All right. Mm-hmm. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Mustache tails.